evening when you hear from God's Word. Uh, this evening's Bible reading comes from uh, Paul's first letter to the Corinthians, uh, chapter 14, verses 1 through to 25. 1 Corinthians 14. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues, but I would rather have you prophesy. He who prophesies is greater than the one who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets, so that the church may be edified. Now, brothers, if I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will I be to you, unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what tune is being played unless there is a distinction in the notes? Again, if the trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So it is with you. Unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will just be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of languages in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I am a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you. Since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to excel in gifts that build up the church. For this reason, anyone who speaks in a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For, I, if, for if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. So what shall I do? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you are praising God with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who do not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you are saying? You may be giving thanks well enough, but the other man is not edified. I thank God that I speak in tongues more than all of you, but in the church... I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking be adults. In the law it is written, through men of strange tongues and through the lips of foreigners I will speak to this people, but even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Tongues then are a sign, not for believers but for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues, and some who do not understand or some unbelievers come in, will they not say that you are out of your mind? But if an unbeliever or someone who does not understand comes in while everyone is prophesying, he will be convinced by all that he is a sinner and he will be judged by all, and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So he will fall down and worship God, exclaiming, God is really among you. This is the word of the Lord. The music stand this evening because it's a little bit easier than going back to the pulpit the whole time. So, the musicians, sorry about that. It's a big passage uh, to get through. I'm going to go through it quite quickly, so I'm not going to focus on a massive amount of detail, just so we can get through it. Uh, there's a lot of repetition here, and there really is only, only one overall point that is being made by the Apostle Paul, so hopefully we'll be able to get to that. Um, so just bear with me as we, we try and get through this. Oops, this thing's already gone funny. Sorry. 
I know you don't want me here forever, so I better get my stopwatch going. Let's pray. Our Father, we uh, come to a passage that is quite detailed, that speaks to us particularly about how the gifts are used in the church, and we need your understanding. Even though we may not speak in tongues or we may not prophesy, we want to understand how these general principles apply to us in terms of how we use our own gifts in this church, though they may be different to the ones being spoken of in this passage. So help us not to switch off because we don't have these two gifts, but help us to listen to what you're saying to us in terms of how we are meant to use our gifts within the body of Christ. And we pray that we would come away encouraged, come away informed, and come away changed in some way. For Jesus' sake, amen. A do-it-yourself catalog, I couldn't resist this, a do-it-yourself catalog from a firm received the following letter from one of its customers. You know, it's that, like when you go to Ikea and you get these kits and you try and put them together, and I don't know, it always says, take you an hour, it takes me about five hours. This is one of those, except it was done by post. I built a birdhouse according to your stupid plans, and not only is it much too big, it keeps blowing out of the tree, signed, unhappy, The firm replied, dear unhappy, we are sorry for the mix-up. We accidentally sent you a sailboat. But if you think you are unhappy, you should read the letter from the guy who came in last in the yacht club regatta. (laughs) Now, there's a sense in which Paul is saying exactly that. There's no point in exercising a gift if it has no relevance. If you try and stand up and, and use a gift, but everyone sits in the congregation and they're confused, they don't know what's going on, they don't understand it, they have no idea why you're saying what you're saying, then what you have got and what you are using is absolutely pointless. And sometimes even within the spectrum of the use of gifts lies behind it the motivation for using the gifts. So for the Corinthian church, what was really important for them was the spectacular stuff. You know, if you've got a gift that is, is out there and everyone sees the way it's being used, then those are the gifts that you eagerly desire after. And Paul tries to correct them in this understanding and says it doesn't matter how spectacular your gift is. It doesn't matter how great your gift is. But if the body is not being edified by the use of your gift, then you're wasting your time and you're wasting the time of the body in the use of your gift. So while Paul specifically hones in on how this applies in terms of tongues, It also applies more generally in terms of the gifts that God has given us. If we are selfishly using our gifts for our own edification, if we are using our gifts so that people pat us on the back and say, well done, and and we're so glad that you're using your gifts, if we're using our gifts just to receive praise from people, it's the wrong reason for the use of our gifts. Gifts are meant to serve others. Gifts are meant to be other-centered. They're meant to edify the body. They're meant to build up the church. And so whatever gift God has given us, it must be directed towards that end. And if it's not directed towards that end, then we need to examine ourselves and our hearts. And let me tell you that one of the dangers of of standing up front and doing what I'm doing right now, preaching is an incredible danger in that because it's a very, very upfront gift. And it's very easy as a preacher to try and fish, if I can put it like that, fish for compliments. And Nathan will bear me out, and Will will bear me out, my wife will bear me out on this. I say to her, whenever people come up afterwards, I mean, you get complaints and, and you get building up, so the one cancels out the other, although you always remember the criticisms, not the, not the positive ones. But when you do get positive comments, I always say to Janice, I just take it with a pinch of salt. What's really important at the end of the day is that the body, through the use of your gifts, are being edified. And if they being edified, then God is pleased. And I'm more concerned to please God than I am to please people. 
And so that should be the foundation from which all of our gifts spring. Now, what's happening in the Corinthian situation is that this gift of tongues is being elevated above the other gifts. It's a really sought-after gift. People want it because it's a showy gift, and it, it kind of almost says to the congregation, see, I have the Spirit in great measure, because only those with the Spirit in great measure can speak in tongues. And Paul cuts right across that. So come with me as we go to the text and we work our way through it. Firstly, I want you to notice the importance of edification. The importance of edification. And it's really important that we, we see that. Verses 1 to 5. Follow the way of love and eagerly desire spiritual gifts, especially the gift of prophecy. For anyone who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men but to God. Indeed, no one understands him. He utters mysteries with his spirit. But everyone who prophesies speaks to men for their strengthening, encouragement, and comfort. He who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophesies edifies the church. So Paul begins by grounding all of these gifts, and I'm not going to speak a lot about this because Nathan dealt with it last week, but he begins the, the whole passage by saying, remember, whatever else you do, your gifts and the use of your gifts must be grounded in love. If you are not serving out of a heart overflowing from love, then you are not serving for the right reasons. And so he emphasizes that in verse 1, follow the way of love and eagerly desire the greater gifts. Now, when he talks about greater gifts, he's not talking about greater gifts in terms of the way in which they edify the body, but greater gifts in terms of the way in which they show themselves. So he's not putting gifts necessarily on a hierarchical scale so much as he is saying there are some gifts that are useful and there are some gifts that are not that useful. And if you're using a gift that no one understands, well, you're wasting your time. So eagerly desire the greater gifts. Quite literally, they are to run after love, pursue it with great energy, and let their gifts spring from the heart that overflows with love. When a tongue is interpreted, and it's uh, not interpreted, and it's spoken in a situation, and only God knows what's spoken, what's the point? Because you may well understand what you're saying, you may well receive some edification from that, but that's not the point of the gifts. And if no one else understands, only God understands, you're wasting your time. And so Paul wants to say, forget about tongues if there is no uh, edification. Forget about tongues if there's no interpretation. Because the body is not edified. And so then he uses hyperbole to make the point. Notice how he does that. Um, but everyone who prophets, sorry, I know, I he who speaks in a tongue edifies himself, but he who prophets edifies the church. I would like every one of you to speak in tongues. Now, that's clearly hyperbole. Paul is not simply saying that he wants the whole church to be engaged in speaking in tongues, but he's simply using hyperbole to make the point. And the point that he's making is that even if every one of you could speak in tongues, but there's no interpretation, well, it's a waste of time. But... The one who prophesies, now remember when we went through the gifts, that prim primarily prophesying is the speaking forth of the Word of God. And sometimes that prophecy may happen in a, in a private session, in a counseling session, but the most likely place where prophecy happens is in the church, where the Word of God is proclaimed, where application of the Word of God is brought. And so the Apostle Paul is simply saying, if you're prophesying, you're speaking something that everyone else understands, and that's worth so much more than something spoken that is not understood. Unless, of course, tongues is interpreted. So that's what he says. He who prophesies is greater than one he who speaks in tongues, unless he interprets so that the church may be edified. So if all you take away from verses 1 to 5, the whole emphasis on verses 1 to 5 is do and exercise a gift that builds up the body, that edifies the body. That's worth much more. You know, it's very easy to sometimes wish for certain gifts that are more spectacular. And to, ho and, and, and to think to ourselves, it would be nice if I had that gift. Sometimes the church 
it can be filled with envy for others who have gifts that we don't have. But what Paul wants to do is encourage everyone and say, just remember, whatever gift God has given you, if it's used for the edification of the body and you're doing it out of love, that's worth far more than any spectacular gift that you see exercised like tongues. So be encouraged. It may be standing at the door serving, shaking someone's hand. And if that's edifying the body through the welcome of the greeting, it's better than standing up front and speaking in tongues. So there's a general encouragement, I think, to use our gifts for the edification of the body. Secondly, I want you to see the importance of understanding, verses 6 to 19. We'll try and work our way through these, very, again, very quickly, just for the sake of time. Verses 6 through to 19. Now, brothers, now I want you to see how he sets up this scenario. Paul is not saying, I do these things. But if I do these things, in other words, he's setting up a hypothetical situation. And the reason he sets up a hypothetical situation is in order to drive home his point with force. And you must see that right from the word. Now, if, the key word there is if, I come to you and speak in tongues, what good will it be unless I bring you some revelation or knowledge or prophecy or word of instruction? Even in the case of lifeless things that make sounds, such as the flute or harp, how will anyone know what the tune is being played unless there's a distinction in the notes? Again, if a trumpet does not sound a clear call, who will get ready for battle? So let me just pause there. He uses two different analogies to drive home this point. And the one analogy is the flute that was played at funerals, it was played in worship services, and it was also played at weddings. And if all the fl- flautist does, or if all the harper says, whoever it is, if all they do is play one single note, if uh, Scott on his guitar played one single note, or David on the piano played one single note, none of us would know what's going on. It would be a complete waste of time. And that's simply the point that he's making. And I sometimes sit at home and listen to Janice, my wife, who teaches piano, and when she's trying to get a particular note right, I'll hear her play it over and over again to the student to, for the student to finally get how that particular note works. But I can't tell what tune is being played simply by hearing that note. And that's the same point here. With the trumpet analogy, it's the same thing. What they did with in, in the Corinthian situation is that trumpets were used as warning signals so that if a city was surrounded by an army and they were going to come under attack, the uh, man on top of the wall of the city would get up with his trumpet and he would sound a blast. But there were different blasts or different noises of trumpet blasts that signaled different things. And so if he didn't play the right note, people wouldn't know. But he would play a particular trumpet sound so that the city, as they were awakened, would gather all their fighting men together to be able to defend that city. But if he plays the wrong note, then it's all is in vain. When I did national service, and I know there are some here who have done it as well, you will know that when there, there are certain things, we had Reveille that was a, a trumpet sound at the beginning that woke us all up at five o'clock in the morning. And... and um, that would make sure we would hear this thing go. And then sometimes there'd be a a different trumpet sound at night. And then the last post was played when someone died or when we attended a funeral service. Now, we all recognize that. But if the bugler plays one note, there's no understanding. That's the point he makes in those verses. Let's keep moving. Um, Verse 9. So it is with you, unless you speak intelligible words with your tongue, how will anyone know what you are saying? You will be speaking into the air. Undoubtedly, there are all sorts of language in the world, yet none of them is without meaning. If then I do not grasp the meaning of what someone is saying, I'm a foreigner to the speaker, and he is a foreigner to me. So it is with you, since you are eager to have spiritual gifts, try to sell in the gifts that build up the church. So the apostle Paul there is just making the overall point, saying, yes, he understands there are all kinds of languages in the world, but if you don't understand the language, it's of no use to you. And I've experienced that in in some of my travels, and I'm sure some of you going to Argentina and listening to people speaking in Spanish, I didn't have a clue. They could have been swearing in my company. And I said, Ek for yo preek in Afrikaans, dan verstaan jy nie wat ek sê nie. Maar as jy Afrikaans kan praat, dan weet jy wat het sê. Can someone interpret? 
So if I speak in Afrikaans, none of you will know what I'm saying. That's the point. Because you don't speak Afrikaans. And the point that he's making there, when an unintelligible language comes from the lips, no one understands. And even though there are all kinds of languages in the world, if you don't understand the language, what's the point of getting up and speaking it? There is no point. Then he says, excel in the gifts that build up the church. In other words, the point here that is being made in verse 12 is that we should excel in those gifts that have some way of edifying the church. And so he's going to focus on prophecy by way of contrast. So whether it's prophecy or whether it's some other gift that builds up the church and edifies the church, it doesn't really matter. He uses prophecy here because they're both word gifts. Tongues is a word gift, prophecy is a word gift. And so in order to use words, he uses prophecy as an intelligible way of making words. And so he's going to go on and explain that as we go on. For this reason, anyone who speaks a tongue should pray that he may interpret what he says. For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. Now what Paul is going to argue here is that the spirit and the mind must work in conjunction with each other. They must be working in tandem with each other. You can't have an unfruitful mind. Notice how he argues his case. Well, if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my mind is unfruitful. He says, no good engaging the spirit of the body, and the mind is not being engaged. God is a thinking God. God is a speaking God. What is the very first thing we are told in the Bible? That God spoke and created the world. In the beginning, God said, let there be light. And it is through the spoken word that we have this incredible creation all around us. So the point is that God is a speaking God. God wants us to engage our mind. That's why things like transcendental meditation is so utterly wrong from a Christian point of view. Because they tell you to empty your mind. But I don't know how you empty your mind without thinking about emptying your mind. So it's almost contradictory for me. But the point is that God says the mind, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind. So it's important that we engage the mind in the way in which we function. And if tongues is just some unintelligible word that no one understands, and the mind is not being engaged, Paul says, sit down and shut up. So what shall I do? What's his conclusion? I will pray with my spirit, but I will also pray with my mind. I will sing with my spirit, but I will also sing with my mind. If you're praising with your spirit, how can one who finds himself among those who not understand say amen to your thanksgiving, since he does not know what you're saying? You may well be giving thanks enough, but the other man is not edified. Now, that's really, really important. What they did in the synagogue is when they prayed, at the end of the prayer, everyone would say amen. Does anyone know what amen means? You do. Someone. So let it be. I agree. That's why I encourage it in prayer meetings. When someone's finished praying, I encourage everyone to say out aloud, amen. So let it be. Yes, we agree. And so that's what would happen in the synagogue setting. Paul says, but if there's a tongue, who can agree? Because no one knows what's being said. And since the tongues were quite prevalent in the pagan religion surrounding Corinth, it, this was something they, they knew and understood and saw in action. And, and Paul is just saying, please make sure that it's intelligible. He goes on. I thank God. Now again, he speaks in hyperbole. I thank God that I speak tongues more than all of you. But in the church, I would rather speak five intelligible words to instruct others than 10,000 words in a tongue. Here's an amazing thing. When you think about Paul, his commission is to the Gentiles. Now, if Paul is going out to the Gentiles, there are different languages among Gentiles. So 
it seems as though what Paul is saying, there are times where God must have given him the ability to speak, even though we don't have anything recorded in Scripture, speak in another language that enabled him to communicate the gospel to the Gentiles because he was the apostle to the Gentiles. But at the end of the day, Paul says it doesn't matter whether I speak in all kinds of tongues, all kinds of languages. If I'm in with you in Corinth and I'm in your church in Corinth, and I'm speaking in some foreign language that none of you understand, I I would rather that I stand up and speak five intelligible words. It's incredible, isn't it? Than a whole raft of tongues. He speaks in hyperbole to lay huge emphasis on the need for intelligibility. Can I quote Don Carson on this? One lesson, however, comes through these first verses in 1 Corinthians 14 with startling force. Whatever the place for profound personal experience and corporate emotional experience, the assembled church is the place for intelligibility. Our God is a thinking, speaking God. And if we will know him, we must learn to think his thoughts after him. I'm not so typically in validating what Paul has refused to invalidate. I'm merely trying to reflect his conviction that edification in the church depends on utterly on intelligibility, understanding, coherence. Both charismatic and non-charismatic churches need to be reminded of that truth again and again. And so if there is going to be tongues spoken in the church... There must be intelligibility, either the speaker interprets or someone in the congregation interprets. But Paul says, rather desire the gifts that are in the native language in which that church operates, because that is going to have a much clearer edification of the church. It's going to be understood, intelligible. So there's no room in any church doesn't matter whether it's here or whether it's in some other church of no interpretation of tongues. Wherever that occurs, it's not coming from God. I'm not trying to knock other churches. Please don't misunderstand me. That's not my job. Satan's good at doing that. I am here, though, to say that God's word makes it abundantly clear that where tongues are spoken, there must be intelligibility. There must be understanding. There must be interpretation. Everything must happen according to the order that God has prescribed in his word. And we're going to see a bit more of that next week, although there are other complicated issues in next week's sermon. Thirdly, I want you to notice the importance for unbelievers. Look at verses 20 to 25. The importance of unbelievers. From verse 20. Brothers, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. In other words, Paul is saying, grow up. Stop acting like spiritual babies. It's time you started progressing in your spiritual walk. The only time you should be acting like children is in terms of evil, because children are less likely to commit horrendous acts of evil than adults. Yes, they do naughty things. Yes, they they do things they ought not to do. But very rarely are you going to find a a six-year-old shooting another five-year-old. And so in terms of evil, yes, think like that. But in terms of your spiritual practices within the church, the Apostle Paul is saying, come on now, grow up and and become spiritually mature. Stop stymieing your growth and, and staying back there and thinking like infants. It's not my words. Those are Paul's words. And the Lord has written, now this is really interesting. Through the men of strange languages and through lips of foreigners, I will speak to this people. But even then they will not listen to me, says the Lord. Now, of course, that is referring back to God speaking to the Israelites through the Assyrians in the northern kingdom. 
Remember, as a result of the rebellion of the northern kingdom, God eventually says, I've sent prophet after prophet after prophet. You refuse to listen to me. I'm tired of speaking through my own prophets. Now I'm going to speak to you through a foreign nation. And God raises up the Assyrian army. And he takes this Assyrian army, and I find this fascinating, then he sends them into the northern kingdom, they decimate the northern kingdom, they take those people, they kill them, they take them out to Egypt, they they get lost in the Assyrians, and the northern kingdom is never really, really reconstituted after that. And that's the foreign tongues. God is saying, if you're not going to listen to me, I'm going to speak to you through the foreign languages of people. In other words, the point that is being made here now is that tongues is a sign, as he's going to make very clear, for unbelievers. And it's a judgment sign. And the judgment sign that it is, is that it brings them under the judgment of God when it's done correctly. And they hear the gospel. They are convicted of their sin. They fall down and they are converted. But that's not happening in Corinth. Because tongues is not happening the way it ought to happen. So what happens in Corinth? Well, he tells you. Read on. Tongues then are a sign not for believers, but for for unbelievers. Prophecy, however, is for believers, not for unbelievers. That, in a sense, is, is, is obvious, isn't it? If tongues causes them to come under conviction as it's interpreted, but prophecy is the preaching, it's primarily directed towards believers. So if the whole church comes together and everyone speaks in tongues and some we do not understand or some unbelievers come in. Now, those are two groups of the same people. So some we do not understand or some who come in are all the unbelieving people that come in the church. So now what's happened is you've got some people who have never been to church or have been invited by their friends to come to church and they've come to church and they're sitting in the church and now suddenly tongues breaks out. So if it uh, comes together... Will they not say that you are out of your mind? Literally, if you take the the literal language and you translate that, Paul is saying they think you're mad. They think you're nuts. You belong in the place where they put white jackets on you with straps. But if an unbeliever or someone else who does not understand comes in while everyone is prophesying, in other words, while the preaching of the word is going on, he will be convinced that he is a sinner and he will be judged by all and the secrets of his heart will be laid bare. So we fall down and worship exclaiming God is really among you. Now what Paul is doing is contrasting the different effect of these two different things that happen on the congregation. So if an unbeliever comes in and everyone's speaking in tongues and he doesn't understand what's going on, and I've been in that situation, I can understand exactly how an unbeliever would feel. And you hear this strange stuff going on in the congregation. They come in and think, what on earth is going on here? I don't understand what's going on. It sounds very strange. I don't understand these languages. These people must be nuts. And the unbeliever leaves leaves the church. He walks out because he thinks that there's something strange going on. And his condemnation is now sealed. That's why it's a sign for unbelievers in this context, a negative sign. Shouldn't be, it should be a positive, but it's a negative sign because they coming in, and if they were to stay in, perhaps they would come under conviction of the word, and as a result of coming under the conviction of the word, they would be saved. But now they think church is for nutcases, and they get out of the church as fast as they can, and they don't come back, and in turn they've sealed their fate forever. That's tragic. The unbeliever is chased out because what's happening in the church is unbiblical. And that puts their lives in a great danger, perilous state. Conversely, if the unbeliever comes in and people are standing up and preaching, prophesying, proclaiming the word of God, and then the Holy Spirit falls upon them through the proclamation of the word, then they come under the conviction of God. And as a result of coming under the conviction of God, literally it says they fall down on their faces and are overwhelmed with a sense of conviction of the gospel. And as a result of that, they turn away from their sin, they turn towards God, they exercise faith in God, and they are saved. And the whole body praises God. Because they've been saved. And what's the exclamation? God is really among you. God is really among you. Now, you don't have to be an elaborate preacher for that. You don't have to be 
a trained preacher for that to occur. When you read the conversion, I want to read it to you because just to show you how simple proclamation of God's word, just the very basic proclamation of God's word, something that you would think is going to have no impact whatsoever causes someone to get saved, someone you all know. I was years and years upon the brink of hell. I mean, in my own feeling, I was unhappy. I was desponding. I was despairing. I dreamed of hell. My life was full of sorrow and wretchedness, believing that I was lost. Because of a so snowstorm, the 15-year-old's path to the church was diverted down a side street. For shout, he ducked into the primitive Methodist chapel on Artillery Street. An unknown substitute lay preacher stepped into the pulpit and read the text from Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be ye saved, all the ends of the earth, for I am God and there is no other. He had not much to say, thank God, for that compelled him to keep on repeating his text. And there was nothing needed by me at any rate except his text. Then he stopped and he pointed to where I was sitting in the gallery. We don't do this anymore in preaching. And he said, that young man there looks very miserable. And he shouted, I think as only a primitive Methodist can, look, 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 young man, look now. Then I had this vision, not a vision to my eyes, but to my heart. I saw what a Savior Christ was. Now I can never tell you how it was. But I no sooner saw whom I was to believe than I also understood what it is to believe. And I did believe in one moment. And as the snow fell on my road home from the little house of prayer, I thought every snowflake talked with me and told me of the pardon I'd found, for I was white as I was driven snow through the grace of God. Upon his return home, his appearance called his mother to exclaim, something wonderful has happened to you. Charles Spurgeon's conversion. Through a simple... Methodist preacher who wasn't trained. Isn't that ironic? Wasn't trained? And stood up and said, look, look, look ye to the ends of the earth and be saved. And God took the simple proclamation of the word from an untrained mouth and saved one of the greatest preachers that the Baptist has ever known. Yes, and that could be your experience too. You don't have to be trained. But God values the proclamation of his word. Maybe it is a word to an unbeliever. Maybe it is a text that God burdens on your heart to share with an unbeliever. That as you, you speak that into their lives, God just comes and descends upon them with the power of the Holy Spirit and they're converted. Either we believe in the power of God's word or we don't the power of the gospel to salvation. And so Paul makes the point when we look at tongues and prophecy, it's not that prophecy is a better gift intrinsically than tongues, but it's a more useful one because it's intelligible. And so whatever way God has gifted you, I know it might not be in tongues, it might not be in prophecy, it might not be in preaching, it might be in some other gift in some other way. As you serve God, can I encourage you that your reason for serving is so that we as the body are edified. That's why you serve. Not for praise from men. Not for accolades. But so the body of Christ might be built up. And in that sometimes way in which God so strangely uses his people, Sometimes coming upon them and just enabling them to speak a word in time into a person's life. Who knows? As you respond in obedience to God, what might be accomplished through that one word that you speak into the life of some unbeliever. Maybe another Spurgeon will rise up from the ranks because you spoke five intelligible words to an unbeliever. So can I encourage you, use God's gifts. Don't worry about what other people think, whether you've got a spectacular or unspectacular gifts. God wants to see his body built up. And so do we. 
Amen. Our Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the way in which the body of Christ is built up through the use of the gifts. And so I pray that you would take this church and you would continue to raise up people, continue to enable them and strengthen them by the power of the Holy Spirit to use their gifts, whatever those gifts may be. To know that as they seek to serve you, as they express their love for you in their service of others, as they give of themselves, that this body here at Castle Hill Baptist might be built up to the glory of God and that we might praise God and that we might see people in this place brought, brought from death to life. For Jesus' sake, amen.